The, the second sin sort of is to try and make self-sovereign identity free as in beer and not as in speech. Uh, now, some of you may recognize this terminology from the free software movement, um, where the, 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 the whole sort of like in a uh, chasm between is it open source software or is it free software and what does that actually mean? And one of the terminology was like free as in beer, which is like it does not cost money versus free as in speech, which is, is it philosophically something that you can build upon and remix and you know, collaborate together, build an open system, open ecosystem where the data has been built. And I think one of the problems is to try and make it free as in beer. The problem is it doesn't give incentives for the issuing organizations to give those credentials out in the first place. But how does this actually then translate into what's happening elsewhere in the industry? Um, now, to take a quick example, like one of the companies that has got into the identity game quite recently is Stripe. You might have heard of them. They're one of the largest sort of card acquirers in the world, a bit like PayPal. Uh, so they have a new product called Stripe Identity, which allows uh, merchants or online you know, sites that use the Stripe product to verify a person's identity. And what's quite interesting is like they have, because they're one of the largest card processors in the world, they have a lot of different signals based on which they can carry out those ID checks. And what's quite interesting is when you look at the price point that they're charging and to, the, to what I was saying, um, if you could drive the per price uh, or the per sort of ID check cost down much lower than what it is at right now, the, the five to $10 range, if you, if you can get that down to say 30 pence, 30 cents or 10 cents, what happens is, it becomes significantly a larger addressable market, which can start then using verified identity, which I think ultimately increases the number of places where a self-sovereign identity gets used. Um, and if the self-sovereign identity uh, is, there's there's demand for it from people, then you know there's 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 an aspect of it which is which is simple. And it's, I will completely agree that SSN is not any kind of, uh, you know, trustworthy number, but that's, that's exactly where a lot of different organizations work on. Like the default in a lot of uh, manual processes is to rely on stuff like that. But I guess the more fundamental point that I was trying to make is that the, the price point of like verified ID checks through companies like the Onfidos and the Trulios of the world, by definition, limits it to use cases, say in finance or in KYC, where they have to do it because of a regulatory reason and because they have to go spend that money. Um, but Stripe is a good example of like, you know, something that is offering an ID product at a much, much, much lower price point. And therefore it's viable for a much larger segment, for instance, like e-commerce, where for instance, if you were trying to spend five to $10 per transaction in an e-commerce transaction to understand is this a real user who's buying a product um, or is this a fraudster who's perhaps stolen somebody's credit cards. The, the fact that like, you know, the, the cost of like, you know, verifying the identity of the user has been pushed much further down is what makes it viable in a whole new different market segment. And what, what's quite interesting is I think SSI is not just useful in high friction use cases, which is the uh, which is the KYCs of the world. I don't go and open bank accounts that often, but I'm quite regularly perhaps going into an e-commerce merchant, an e-commerce website and trying to verify that like, you know, I'm a real person who's buying it and not just a fraudster who's used a stolen credit card to buy an 800 pound uh, iPhone, uh, which the merchant will lose, like they've lost the expensive item and perhaps get hit by a chargeback later on, it just suddenly unlocks the ability to have, say, um, the ability for SSI to be used in a lot more different places. Um, but having said that, I don't think, you know, commercializing SSI or charging for credential usage necessarily mean locks, locked credentials. Um, and what I mean by locked credentials is you have to make a payment before you can see this particular credential. I think um, some diff some ecosystems might go and might opt for an, uh, opt for a system like that, but 
it kind of violates the principle of like, I have a digital credential that I control and I can share with someone and therefore prove some attributes that might belong to me. Um, so an analogy that I give over here is, for example, if you have a driver's license, you can go take that to a grocery store or when you're buying, say, alcohol, and you can show it to the person at the till to prove that your age is above 18. Now, what they do is they check the, this looks like a legitimate looking document. It has all of the different security features on it. And I believe in like the, the age, therefore, that you're sort of presenting across to me. They don't necessarily need to know if the credential is actually valid. And what I mean by that is I could have a plastic driver's license in my hand that has expired, uh, but a legitimate document or a legitimately issued document at some point in time. Um, but for the purposes of giving my ID, that could still be used. So if you think about it, in that particular use case, what matters is the fact that Yes, you had a driver's license that was actually issued by, say, a government agency, and therefore it attests that your age is above X. But let's take a different example. If you have, uh, if you have that same driver's license and you go along to a car rental agency and you want to rent a car, on that particular occasion, not only do they need to know is physically this document that you've just presented in front of me, is that a legitimate document or not? But we might also need to determine is, is it really valid? Because I could have a driver's license that it has an expiry date of 2034, but has actually been revoked because I moved my address and therefore I've been issued a new one. Or it was reported as lost. So I am not in possession of it anymore. I was a subject of that particular driver's license. I'm not in possession of it anymore. Somebody else does. Uh, so therefore, I call up the government agency. I say, like, you know, can you please revoke that particular driver's license? Um, so the car rental agency does need to know it not only is the information presented valid at the time it was issued, uh, but it also is it valid right now. And the expiry date on its own, if it's presented on a credential, does not solve that problem because you can you can have a scenario where there are things like passports or driver's licenses which have an expiry date far into the future, but are not actually active documents. And so one of the ideas that sort of we've been exploring within the space is how do we, uh, how do we solve the problem of like not necessarily creating a locked credential, but giving the ability, for instance, say, you have a credential that you can share with anyone and that's up to you. That's as a holder, it's something that you can choose. The recipient of that credential, so the verifier, the verifier then has a choice. The verifier can see that it's a valid presentation or it's a valid credential. They can see that it was issued by a trustworthy issuer. But if they want to see whether the credential itself is valid right now, what they need to check is the revocation status of the credential. And the revocation status of the credential is the bit that's actually um, noteworthy or valuable that is happening in this transaction. And if you if you meter something like that, wh where you arrive at is something like a freemium model where everyone is, as a subject holder, free to present the credential to someone. But if as a verifier or as a receiver of that credential, if you want to check if that is still valid, that's when you pay money. And that money that you pay uh, for carrying out the revocation check is ultimately something that can be moved to a price point that is much, much, much cheaper than what traditional ID verification providers can do right now. So I hope that makes a, sort of like in a sense so far, uh, but one of the ways that I sort of like, you know, go and uh, describe this is what I call like the SSI flywheel for adoption. And what I mean by that is by creating a better user experience for privacy and security, more people will demand to use SSI, which means more people will accept SSI. But to make that happen, what, in, what we need to ensure is the first part, which is how do we get more organizations, more companies to be issuing SSI credentials in the first place? Um, and part of that is like, you know, how do you uh, lower the costs for creating that data, 
And so if the cost of like, you know, creating that data, if they can issue you a credential and it does not cost them $5 to like get the identity details checked in the first place, if it costs them 10 cents, then they're more incentivized to issue you a credential. But what that also means is that the people downstream who are consuming it therefore have lower prices. What's important here is that I don't think it's necessarily checked or any particular company that is working within the SSI space that should fix that price. It's up to a credential issuer to decide what value it is that they want to put upon themselves in terms of um, what it takes to unlock, say, the credential or unlock the revocation status. And in a, in a, in a marketplace economy, what you'll naturally see is there will be uh, credential issues who charge a very high amount or a very low amount, um, but they might be carrying out checks to a different level or they might be checking different things. Uh, it might be directly associated with like how complex it is to carry out that check. So um, in a marketplace economy, what you'll find is like there's naturally going to be uh, a demand and supply thing that is being filled in on like, you know, what should be the, what should a majority of like, you know, those prices be at.